Thank you so much, Nancy. Wonderful salute to the armed forces on this Memorial Day. Good morning, everyone. Let's begin our worship today. If you'll open the back cover of your hymnal, on the back right side, you'll find my eyes have seen the glory. Good morning to all of you here in person, those watching on our live stream or watching us on YouTube. We are glad to have you with us on this Memorial Day weekend, uh, a solemn holiday in the United States uh, where Americans are called upon to remember those who fought and died in the service of their country. Uh, a different take on the non-commercial side of, of Memorial Day weekend. Turn with me, if you will, to hymn number 52. This is not a patriotic hymn, this is a regular hymn, but it's appropriate for the weekend. Oh Jesus, I have promised, number 52. Weekend uh, today, at two, at, at, at the weather holds, and I hope that it will. 
this afternoon at 2 o'clock, there is a Memorial Day celebration or observation out at Gilbert Country Park. Uh, if you go out Longdale Avenue just past the Science Center, the very next street is called Ormond. It's a little tiny road that leads to a parking lot, and the Veterans Memorial is right just at the edge of that parking lot. That's at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Also, um, we want to take a moment to welcome back our dear friend Nancy Fogarty, who is with us this morning, especially thanking her for her patriotic music, but also we're, we're so grateful for the fact that she's going to be with us this summer. During the summertime, Janice goes up to New York State and, and is the, one of the administrators at Chautauqua. And she's been doing that for 25 years. And so we, we miss her during the summer, but we are so overwhelmingly fortunate to have Nancy here because Nancy is also a marvelous, marvelous pianist, and we're so grateful to have her. Our prayer hymn this morning is one more patriotic piece. This is hymn number 226. 226, My Country, Tis of Thee. Great, great uh, 
example that you set for the rest of us. Let's all just hang around that long. I have to unannounce what to make. Yes, ma'am. Wednesday was your birthday. Yes, it was. <laughs> but I wasn't with 84. I'm still a young kid compared to her. <laughs> okay, a young wife calls her husband at work. And he said, honey, I am so busy. Can't this wait till I get home? She said, no, I've got some good news and bad news. He says, okay, okay. Give me the good news. And she said, well, the airbags on the new car work real good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> We're blessed today to have Tom Willie with us. What a great storyteller. Jim, glad to be back. This is session number three that started a number of weeks ago with a break, and uh, this is our third and final session. And you have, I hope, in your hand uh, stapled three sheets together, did the best I could to compile them. And uh, I know there's probably been a staggered attendance maybe in uh, in your attendance just because of this and that. So let me take a, a minute or two and bring us up to date before we visit with our friend Isaiah. Um, we're going to look at the top page first that says, On the Road to Emmaus. You know, some denominations, I'm not sure they do uh, currently, but I know they used to have an Emmaus walk you ever heard of that? I've never gone on one, um, but I think it's a weekend where people are uh, uh, encouraged to come sign up and have a, a, a faith boost, a uh, reconnection, or a, a, a deeper connection. And that's how it got its name from the passage on Easter afternoon, which I've called the, On the Road to Emmaus. And uh, it's an absolutely riveting passage. And it's a story, but a true story, about two followers of Christ uh, up to this weekend, and their hopes are shattered because the one they thought was the Messiah Savior ended up executed. So they were, I guess, beginning to now look for an alternative Savior, Messiah, until Jesus joined them as they were walking home. And for the rest of that day, these two and others that they ran back to later in the day connected the dots and realized Jesus had to die and rise again. Jesus had made that clear on a number of occasions in his ministry. We're going to Jerusalem. I will be executed. I will raise, I'll be raised again three days later. Uh, God doesn't play hide and go seek. He made it clear. And on the road to Emmaus, to these two dejected disciples, he rolled out Old Testament passages that pointed to his death and resurrection. So that's what I've been doing the last, uh, including today, three weeks. But to look again at the road to a man's passage and then go back to the Old Testament and grab a couple of places where Jesus probably went on Easter afternoon. And on Easter evening, it was an aha moment. Now I get it. He had to die and rise again. I heard a quote not too long ago, which I love, and I'll try to remember to say it again as I land my plane in a few minutes. But listen to this. Before we begin to see the cross as something done for us, we have to see it as something done by us. Let me read that again. And the bottom line is, 
every single one of us in this room put Jesus Christ on the cross in a sense. None of us are perfect. We are all sinners. We all need the Savior. Before we can begin to see the cross as something done for us, we have to see it as something done by us. Hope that connects. And as we go through this passage and these passages, we'll see that as we go. Just let's cruise through page one first of all. It's the story, the road to a mass. Passover has just ended. Passover was a festival in Israel, the biggest one of the year. And they had celebrated that weekend. Now that same day, Easter Sunday is where we are. And this is a Luke passage, and he has just talked about the resurrection of Jesus Easter morning. On that same day, to them, we're headed home, and I'm going to skim, and you follow with your eyes. They had a seven-mile walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus, a small town right nearby, and they were discussing everything that had happened. Obviously, the situation with Jesus, his death, and his supposed resurrection that they had just heard rumors as they were leaving town. And as they were walking along, Jesus joined them. It says, Jesus himself came up. Notice how Luke says, Jesus himself really was in. But they were kept from recognizing, and Jesus ventures a question. What are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood downcast, second paragraph. You mean to say you're the only one that's been in Jerusalem and don't realize what we're talking about? Obviously, the death of Jesus. And they explained that in uh, the third paragraph. He was a prophet. This was the extent of their belief system. Prophet, powerful in word, uh, in word and deed before God and all people, chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be crucified. We had hoped, notice, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel, get Rome off our backs, and rule the world. That's his second coming. His first coming had to pay the price for our sin. But they didn't get that yet. We had hope, but we're now shattered. He was executed. And he said, our women, some women in our group, came and told us as we were leaving, they went to the tomb, didn't find his body. They'd seen a vision of angels. And uh, some of our companions, that would be Peter and John, went to the tomb. And they found it just as the women had said. Now look at what Jesus says, paragraph 1, 2, 3, 4. It seems like he's irritated. It seems like he's frustrated with how they have failed to process the obvious. He said to them, how foolish you are. How slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Didn't the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses, first five books of the Old Testament, and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. Boy, that's a signal that the Old Testament has a strong Jesus peace, in particular about his death and resurrection. They approach the village. Jesus makes like he's going further, and they invite him to come in and spend the night, and he joins them. And uh, as they are talking with Jesus, their eyes were opened. I'm in the middle of that uh, two, four, fifth paragraph down. Their eyes were opened. They recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, weren't our hearts burning within us while, we, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to us? It wasn't just another lecturer. It was someone who lit their fire. Weren't our hearts burning? 
which I venture to say that is what the Bible is designed to do. Give us heartburn in the healthy sense of that term. So when they realized that Jesus had to die, rose again, it's late at night, and they decide we're going to go straight back at once to Jerusalem. Next paragraph. And there they found the eleven, that's minus Judas, and others with them. And they said, it's true, the Lord has risen, appeared to Peter, Simon. And they told them what had happened as they walked home. And Jesus, it says, himself, notice that at the end of that paragraph, again Luke says, Jesus himself popped into the room, stood among them, and started out, peace be with you guys, said gals. They were startled. And Jesus said, why are you troubled? Why did doubts rise in your bones? And he presents the nail-scarred hands. And he allows them to touch them. And then he says, uh, could I have something to eat? The last paragraph, notice he's still very insistent. This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the first five books and in the prophets and in the Psalms. So what we have done last time we were together, we turned the page and looked at a couple of passage from Moses, passages from Moses. i got to be brief. The first Last week, Leviticus says that when the worshiper goes to the tabernacle or the temple in the Old Testament, they bring an animal. And as soon as they walk in, that animal is sacrificed by the worshiper. It's a coming picture of the death of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Just watch a couple of things in the second paragraph, Leviticus 1. Verse 3, notice it says, bring a male from the herd or the flock without defect, without defect. That looks to Jesus, perfectly God in a body, the virgin conception keeps him pure. A male without defect. The worshiper, a couple sentences in, you were to lay your hand on the head of this animal symbolizing the transfer of the worshiper's sin to the sacrificial animal. See that? It's imperative we get that. And then the worshiper is handed a knife and they take out the animal. Lay your hand on the head of the burnt offering to make atonement for you and you are to slaughter that animal. And Aaron's sons will apply the blood. The animal sacrifices in the Old Testament looked forward to as John the Baptist introduced Jesus. Folks, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We then looked at the book of Exodus for a couple of lines, a celebration of the Passover. God's people were in Egypt for 400 years. Moses asked Pharaoh ten times, uh, to let the people of Israel go ten times, he said no. Nine times plagues fell on Egypt. The land was ruined. Pharaoh had said no nine times. Moses went and said, Pharaoh, one more time, will you let us go? He said no. And that night the angel of death passed over, hence the title, passed over, pass over Egypt. And the firstborn, you remember, was killed. It was against all the gods of Egypt, the scripture says. But God's people, the Jews, were asked to take a lamb, slay it, and put the blood on the door posts of their homes. And when the angel of death passed over, passed over again, they were spared because the blood had been applied personally. You see that. Notice. The Exodus passage, uh, the second paragraph, each household is to take a year-old male without defect in the first line, 
Uh, take some of the blood, end of that second paragraph, put it on the sides and tops of the door frames. And then uh, the, at, down near the bottom, the blood will be assigned for you on the houses where you are. When I see it, I'll pass over. No plague will touch you. It must be eaten inside the house. And the last line, don't break any of the bones, just like Jesus on the cross had already died, no need to break his legs. Then we turned the page, or no, we didn't, uh, let's see. Yes, we did turn to the back of that page and look briefly at Psalm 22. And let's look briefly again before we run out of time to meet Isaiah. Notice how Psalm 22 starts. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God to the Father, my God to the Spirit, says Jesus on the cross. Why have you both turned your back on me? It's a rhetorical question because he's the sin bearer. And God the Father and Spirit had to distance themselves from sin as Jesus was paying the penalty. And just a line or two, uh, verse 7 of under Psalm 22, right in the center of the page. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Uh, obviously, these are the passers-by while Jesus is on the cross. The Roman soldiers in verse 12 across the page are likened to wild animals, bulls, lions. Notice he, down near the very end, verse 16, they pierce my hands and my feet. Friends, that was written a thousand years before Jesus went to the cross. How did David, the author of Psalm 22, know that? Because there are two authors to every Bible verse. Human authors and the overseeing spirit of God inspiring, not dictating. They pierce my hands and my feet. And the last line says, they divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garden, uh, for my garment. That's exactly what happened at the crucifixion. Now, for time's sake, let's jump right into Isaiah for a minute. <coughs> Isaiah is amazing. He's our Christmas prophet friend, for starters, before we look at the page. Isaiah is the one who said, therefore, in chapter 7, the Lord himself will give you a sign, a signal. The virgin shall be with child, give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. Isaiah said that earlier. Emmanuel, God with us. That's who Jesus is. Behold, a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. The virgin conception of Jesus imperative to our faith. Because as God steps into the world, he sidesteps the Adam gene, which we all have. We're perfect to imperfect from the get-go. And just a chapter later, in Isaiah 6, or I'm sorry, Isaiah 9. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. Did you ever let that verse move around in your mind? Listen. Unto us a child is born. That's the human side of Jesus. To us a son is given. God the Son is given to us by God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Do you get that? For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. That's his second coming. Now to the bottom of, I guess, the backside of page 2, Isaiah 52 to Isaiah 53. Are you with me there? This is absolutely amazing. 
Isaiah writes 700 years before Jesus comes. As Psalm 22, written by David a thousand years, watch how Isaiah takes us to the cross and empty tomb of Jesus. Isaiah 52, 13. See, in other words, get this. My servant, and Jesus in this passage is referred to as the servant, in the sense of the Father and the Spirit. I'm here to serve and bail out people. My servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Clearly, that's the end of his ministry and ascension back to heaven. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. That talks about the pre-crucifixion, how he was beaten, flogged. Notice how it reads. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. And obviously, crucifixion extended all that pain and suffering. But you could hardly recognize Jesus when he got to the cross. That's why he died in six hours. It was usually a couple of days. He died in a very short time. Verse 15 says, he will sprinkle many nations. That's talking about the effects of his death, the sprinkling of the blood covering, will affect all nations over time since then. Kings will be quiet, shut their mouths because of him. For when they weren't told while they were alive, they will see when he comes back. And what they have not heard, they understand. Then into Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So Isaiah says, not everybody is going to believe this. Who has embraced our message? And look at the next statement. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? All the young people. All of us men, when we were young boys, would flex our arms and say, can you see this gun? Look at how Isaiah says it. To whom did God roll up his sleeve and flex his muscle? Israel, at the cross, that is where the power of God was focused. He grew up, this is talking about Jesus grew up as an ordinary person, although totally God at the same time. He didn't glow. He didn't have a halo suspended six inches above his head. He looked like a normal person. That's why it says in two, he, God the Son, grew up before him, God the Father, like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground, maybe a virgin conception look. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. No glow, no halo. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire. Then, watch the result of his ministry. I'm on the last page. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering, familiar with pain. This is Jesus, the God-man. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. He wasn't received and appreciated by most. Now the next couple of verses are absolutely astonishing. As his substitutionary death for you and for me is described, watch how it reads. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him, Jesus, God the Son, punished by God the Father, stricken by him, and afflicted. God the Father blasted God the Son. 
Why? So you and I could be forgiven and have eternal life. Look at verse 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. You see the substitutionary move there? He was crushed for our iniquities, not his. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds, we are healed spiritually. Verse 6 makes it clear that all of us fall short of the things of God. All of us were born in Adam. None of us have lived perfectly. Isaiah describes verse 6, we all, we all, you all, and me, like sheep have wandered away, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord, speaking of God the Father, has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see the substitutionary act of Jesus. He was oppressed, afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. Right out of the Gospels, didn't it? He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is silent, so he didn't open his mouth. He was God. He could have called in angelic armies to squash every Roman and false religious leader, but he held back because he's voluntarily dying for you and me. Verse 8, by oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? People didn't sadly realize. For he was cut off from the land of the living, top of the last column, for the transgression of my people he was punished. Look at this, verse 9. Remember I said last week that a crucified victim the body was taken down and thrown into a garbage dump nearby. The disposal of the body was just as awful as the death of the person. And Joseph of Arimathea said, wait, I've got a new tomb. This is unacceptable. Look at how Isaiah prophesied that. Verse 9. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. That's Joseph of Arimathea gave up his tomb. Though he had done no violence, he was sinless. Nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yes, or yet it was God the Father, the Lord's will, to crush him and cause him to suffer so that he could have a relationship with us. And though the Lord make, makes his life an offering for sin, here's a resurrection look, he will see his offering and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. Another resurrection look, do you see it? By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, those that believe in him, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great. He will divide the spoils with the strong. Because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, potentially everybody, but those who embrace, and made intercession for the transgressors. Isn't that amazing? Now I wasn't there on Easter afternoon on the road to Emmaus. But we know Jesus helped a couple of people connect the dots by showing them passages from Moses, from the prophets, from the Psalms. And the light went on. He had to die as our substitute. And they ran to Jerusalem and said the same thing. I did remember to give this quote as I landed my plane. Before we can begin, to see the cross as something done for us, we have to see it as something done by us. We put him there so that we can be together and have eternal life. Well, we're just about at closing time. But it was uh, when I was
was invited by John Sullivan, right on the other side of Easter, said, John, would you take these, and would you be willing to talk about the risen Christ? I said, I'd love to, John, and I thought, in this passage, but how to connect the dots. Their hearts burn as they connect the dots. They run and tell the others who connect the dots, and he's risen indeed. That means, as I read it, go through these passages, I understand, number one, John has a huge problem. He's a friendly God and has an awful eternity. But John now also realizes that God provided a lifeguard. God provided the Savior, the Messiah. Sent God the Son into human form. He lives a perfect life, goes to the cross, and takes our sin penalty on him as our substitute. Pays our penalty. Dies. Is entombed. Rises again. Ascends to heaven. And now in 2024, he comes to live inside people who open their lives and receive the Savior who understand that I do have a lifeguard. I can't contribute to my eternal destiny. The ladder of my salvation is leaning on Jesus, not on John. I'm not good enough. I need the Savior. Aren't these amazing passages? I hope it's clear. And I hope along the way that you have realized just a couple of things. But I need the Savior. I'm not good enough. And God provided the Savior. God the Father and God the Spirit sent God the Son who was willing to be sent into the world. And go through all of this because he wanted a connection with each of us in this room. That is absolutely amazing. I didn't hear this message until I was 25 years old. Uh, and I grew up in a church. And for the first time, and actually on the same day, almost 60 years ago, Linda and I extended a wobbly hand of faith and said, Lord Jesus Christ, we need you in our lives. And I knew that a transaction had been made. I've never recovered. It's not why I'm in ministry. I, I love to tell people about it. And by the way, I'm in ministry, but I, I've never recovered from the day that uh, my heart started burning. Well, I hope this made sense. Show sure, up being with you these three weeks. Let me pray as I wrap up. Can I do that? Lord, these are amazing passages of Scripture. The whole story of Easter afternoon and Easter evening and the whole message of Good Friday. Well, Christmas. God coming. Good Friday, God dying. Easter, God rising and ascending. And then God coming to live inside people who are willing to trust that, believe that. And say, Lord, come into my life. Friend, if you're not sure that Christ is in your life, why don't you make sure right now? You don't have to stand up or raise a hand. You just on the inside need to say, Lord, I get it. I'm not good enough. I welcome the Savior, Jesus Christ, who paid my penalty. He suffered what I should suffer, but he is my substitute did. Lord, come into my life. Lord, I thank you for this class, these friends of mine, and these moments today to visit with you. In Jesus' name, his special name, his risen name we pray. Amen.
Our Heavenly Father, thank you for all the challenges in our life. They are gifts from you that give us the opportunity to grow and are less dependent when circumstances are tough and we are able to rise to the occasion, trusting in you. Our success in handling difficulties increases our sense of security and confidence that with your help, we can overcome the most difficult of circumstances. We trust in you, O oh Lord, to infuse inner strength into us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a good week, everybody. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you.